Hello and welcome to today's webinar, Unauthorized Access to Computer Networks, Protections and Problems with the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. My name is David and I will be in the background answering any WebEx technical questions. If you experience technical difficulty at any time during this event, please submit your technical issue in the Q&A panel and I will assist you. Please note that as an attendee, you're part of a larger audience today. However, due to privacy concerns, the attendee list is not displayed. All attendees will be in a listen-only mode for the duration of today's call. And as a reminder, this call is being recorded. I would now like to introduce your first speaker for today, Joshua Rich. Joshua, you now have the floor. Thank you, David, and welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Joshua Rich. I am a partner and general counsel at MBHB. When I'm not serving as general counsel, my job really includes uh, being a, a technology and intellectual property litigator and counselor. With me today is Margaret Fleetwood. And Margaret, uh, as you can see, is Dr. Margaret Fleetwood, so she's uh, much more educated than I am. Um, she uh, works in patent prosecution and litigation and uh, also technology uh, counseling and litigation. And she has experience in both tech transfer and advising uh, academic institutions, um, including with regard to portfolio management in intellectual property. So she's uh, got a lot of well-rounded experience that will help us here today. Thank you for joining Hi. us. <laughs> you're, you're welcome, Margaret. Um, thank you all for joining us. Let's talk a little bit about the logistics before we continue on. Um, I know that you're most interested in, in what we'll be talking about, but many of you will also be interested in getting CLE credit. Now, first, you'll be getting a copy of the entire presentation um, that we present today. Within 24 to 48 hours, you'll get a PDF copy of the slides and a link to an archived audio version of the presentation. If you are seeking CLE credit, you will have to submit answers to two poll questions. Now, the poll question is a word that you'll have to answer when the poll question box pops up. And all you have to do is type in the word and hit submit. Um, and as I said, you have to do it both times. And then after the presentation, answer the survey questions if you would. Um, when the questions come up, we will go quiet for an extended period. If you stop hearing us talk, that means either something's gone wrong with your audio, in which case we hope you dial back in or do what you need to do to, to continue to hear, or it'll be a poll question. So uh, that'll be a, a clear clue. Um, we certainly encourage you to present any questions you may have during the webinar using the online question submission module. Uh, it should be generally down to the bottom right of your screen. Time permitting, we will attempt to address submitted questions at the end of the webinar. Um, but if time doesn't permit, we'll respond offline after the webinar. We have a lot to talk about, though, so we may not be able to get to all your questions. And let's get into it. Uh, the, the major topics today are what is the Federal Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, the CFAA for short, um, which Columbia law professor uh, infamously, Tim Wu, infamously called uh, at, at one point the worst law in technology and a nightmare for a country that calls itself free. So um, there are people who aren't big fans of it out there. And honestly, there aren't a whole lot of fans, but it is an important law that is in front of the Supreme Court right now. Uh, in the Van Buren versus United States case. And I'll, I'll talk to you about that case some and, and what the impact may be. Um, we still do not have a verdict from the Supreme Court. No, no opinion has come down, um, even though cases uh, that were argued about the same time have been decided. Um, we'll then proceed to prior interpretations of the CFAA and little CFAA laws. And one of the cases that we'll highlight, which has been in the news recently, is the case of uh, Florida COVID-19 data scientist, Rebecca Jones. Um, you may remember her as the whistleblower who 
was uh, seeking to get information out about COVID-19 cases. And finally, we'll wrap up with best practices for ensuring protection of data and, and your network under the CFAA and little CFAA laws. So let's start with the law itself. Um, the CFAA was enacted in 1986, and it's a criminal statute primarily. Um, it's uh, at 18 USC section 1030, only that one section. Um, now, why is it important that it was enacted in 1986? Well, for those who take an originalist approach, of course, that will be important to know what the intent of the drafters was. Um, and uh, interestingly, there were two incidents that led to the enactment. One was uh, an electronic break-in at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in 1983, where hackers got access to um, the full medical records of patients who were being treated. And uh, it, it came to light that they actually could have changed the treatments, the amount of radiation, the frequency of, of treatment, that sort of thing in the medical records. Um, so that was one key issue. The other incident that led to it was the release of the 1984 Matthew Broderick movie, War Games, um, which Apparently, President Reagan saw and grew concerned that uh, we could have uh, a parade of horribles occur because of hackers getting involved. Um, if, if you haven't seen the movie, uh, it involves Matthew Broderick being a high school uh, student who decides to, to nose around and manages to get into NORAD's computer system and start what he believed was a game of uh, global thermonuclear war. Um, so the CFAA was, CFAA was enacted. And at that time, really the, the concern was government computers, financial institution computers who were linked to one another to transfer money one way or the other and to the Fed. And what are called protected computers from hacking. When we were, those of us who can remember 1986 and, and the computer systems back then, when we were on uh, computers, they were basically standalone devices. There was the ability to get some information over a, a 2600 baud modem. Um, but you did a lot of switching of five and a quarter inch floppy disks, and there, there really wasn't the, the uh, internet that we have today and all the information about people's lives and just generally that is available. So as a general anti-hacking uh, statute, the CFAA also prohibits other things like transmitting malicious viruses, trafficking in passwords, and extortion. And there are civil remedies as well, and we'll, we'll talk about those. But the real key part of the statute that we see litigated time after time is found at 18 USC section 1030A2. And the, the critical parts of it are here. Um, whoever intentionally accesses a computer without authorization or exceeds authorized access, and first we'll talk about accessing a computer and what that means. And then the without authorization or exceeds authorized access part is, is a critical piece. And then the three types of information that uh, you can obtain are, are the next keys. The, the first one, of course, is, is financial information. And that makes a lot of sense because that was available um, in, in private uh, networks, at least. The second one was was government information. And the third was this information from any protected computer. And, and that's really the other key phrase that we're going to talk about. So the first, first issue is, what is a computer? Now, at the, at the time, it was a desktop. And by the way, this is in 18 USC section 1030E1, uh, the definition section for a computer. 
But you can see where the technology was by the ending of what defines a computer. Um, an automated typewriter or typesetter, a handheld calculator or other similar device. So what would be considered a computer today would include things like your cell phone, an, an iPad or other tablet, as well as a computer itself. Um, the next key issue is the without authorization or exceeds, exceeds authorized access phrase. So accessing the computer without authorization, that's somebody who's outside of an organization and gets in when they know they shouldn't be able to get in. It's generally considered the outside hacker portion of the statute. But the second part of that, the exceeds authorized access, is a key question and is, is the key question in the Van Buren case that we'll discuss later. And this is defined at 18 USC section 1030 E6. The term exceeds authorized access means to access a computer without with authorization. So you have the right to get onto that computer and to use such access to obtain or alter information in the computer that the accessor is not entitled so, and I'm emphasizing so, because that's a key term, is not entitled so to obtain or alter. Um, and then uh, we look at, again, um, the statute and try and consider what's a protected computer, this last part. And the term protected computer actually is kind of the, the final exception that swallows the rule. Because at that time, um, we didn't have the internet in the way we do now. A protected computer was exclusively for the use of a financial institution or the United States government. All right, that makes sense. Or in the case of a computer not exclusively for such use, used by or for a financial institution, or the United States government, and the conduct constituting the offense affects that use by or for the financial institution or government. Fine, that makes sense as well. B, used in or affecting interstate or foreign commerce or communication, including a com computer located outside the United States. Well, that's the internet. That's anything that is out there now that is uh, available uh, by getting into uh, a website. And you can see that is so much broader than even C as well, which covers uh, a computer that is, that is part of a voting system. And it's actually only certain voting systems that it relates to. So basically, protected computer has expanded enormously. As I said, there is a civil cause of action under the CFAA as well as the criminal statute that is the primary purpose of the, uh, the statute. Um, any person who suffers damage or loss by reason of a violation of this section, section 1030, and this civil portion is in 1030C4A1, any such person may maintain a civil action to get damages or injunctive relief, but only if there are certain factors set forth, and those have to be found in C4A1. And I've listed them here on the next slide. So there are a, a number of, of issues. Um, really, the one that is is the only important one, the only one that gives rise to, uh, to causes of action is the first one. Loss that during a one-year period aggregates at least $5,000 in value. And that can be hard to prove. Uh, how much is it worth to you to not have false information on your website? How much is it worth to you to not have someone download 
profiles from a dating website, for example. Um, it it's, can be very difficult to prove. Um, but uh, that's the, uh, the one area where you can get damages and they're limited to economic damages. This is reverting back to the, the uh, language of the civil action section, um, which is in 18 USC 1030 G. You can only get economic damages. You can't get harm to reputation. You can't get uh, uh, consequential damages or or punitive damages. So this has to be $5,000 that you've lost out of pocket, which can be very hard to prove up. And it's got a relatively short statute of limitations. You have to, to discover it. And within two years of the discovery, you have to bring the cause of action. And nothing is available for negligent design or manufacture of computer hardware software or firmware. So the CFAA is not intended to be a catch-all uh, computer harm statute. It's really the external hacking and internal hacking of exceeding your authorized access. Um, but of course, what is authorized access is the most critical question in all of the litigation that has gone on under the CFAA. I'm gonna turn from what's in the statute to the case pending in front of the Supreme Court now. So we have our first poll, poll question. Now the poll question is, is now up and open. So please enter CFAA into the poll and hit submit. I'll take a short break and be silent so that you have a little time to do that. Okay, let's move on. Now the poll question box will stay open and advancing the slides will not prevent you from hitting submit, but please do so promptly. Um, let's turn to the Van Buren case, which started out as United States versus Van Buren. And this case is uh, a, a really a, a, an amazing case. It's a, a Southern Gothic film noir tale that, uh, that can only be believed because it actually happened. Um, the cast of characters actually starts with a man in his 60s named Andrew Albo. And Albo was a, a widower in his early 60s who had a penchant for, uh, for younger women, some of whom were underage, some of whom were prostitutes, and some of whom were dancers. And he had developed a... Uh, a scam, a scheme where he would hire a prostitute, give her money, and then accuse her of stealing the money from him so that ultimately he wouldn't have to pay her. Um, but at least of one of the women also claimed that he had recorded and harassed her and reported him to the police. So he came to the coming Georgia Police Department's attention and um, the deputy chief of police warned all of the officers that they should stay away from Alba because he had a mental health condition and it's volatile and you had to be very careful with him. Well, Van Buren, who was a sergeant with the coming Georgia Police Department, did not heed those warnings. Um, instead, after one arrest for providing alcohol to a minor, he started building a relationship with Alba. And um, he was in financial distress and knew that Albo had uh, some money he could do things with, let's say. And uh, so 
Sergeant Van Buren decided to ask Albo for a loan. He asked for over $15,000 for medical treatment for his son. And he said, I have shoddy credit, so I can't get a loan from a bank. Well, Albo wasn't just recording his interactions with prostitutes. He actually was recording his interactions with, with Van Buren as well. And he, uh, he took a recording to a detective in the Forsyth County, Georgia Sheriff's Office and said, I'm getting shaken down um, and complained about Van Buren's actions. And the FBI and GBI, Georgia Bureau of Investigation, um, got wind of this and they decided to set up a sting. First, um, they, they had Albo go to Van Buren and say, hey, if you help me move drugs, I'll give you money. Well, Van Buren wasn't willing to go that far. But then uh, Albo went to Van Buren and said, there's a dancer at a strip club that I'm dating, and I think she may be a prostitute. Or maybe she's an undercover police officer. Can you run her plates for me? And uh, Albo provided Van Buren $5,000 and, uh, and said, this isn't all of it. And Van Buren said, this is just a loan. I'll pay you back. Um, but Albo said, no, no, that's OK. Um, and Van Buren didn't actually search at that point. Albo had another interaction with, uh, with Van Buren and gave him $1,000 saying, I know I'm supposed to give you more than this, but this is what I have at this point. And Van Buren took it and ran the plates. Um, now, it was a made-up plate number, so the, uh, the police, the FBI, and Georgia Bureau of Investigation knew uh, what he was doing was wrong and came to his door the next morning. And in the course of interrogating and arresting Van Buren. Van Buren admitted he knew what he did in accepting money was wrong. At least part of the money was wrong. And uh, that he, he shouldn't have done what he did. Uh, he admitted it was wrong. And so the United States brought charges against Van Buren. Um, and uh, they brought charges on two bases. One is honest services fraud. And the other was felony computer fraud under the CFAA. That's this accessing the information um, and exceeding his authorized use. Van Buren was convicted on both counts and appealed on both counts. On the honest services fraud, um, the Supreme Court has recently cut back what is uh, considered honest services fraud. Um, in a case that involved the governor of Virginia. Um, and the jury instructions, therefore, were, were uh, incorrect, erroneous, and the 11th Circuit remanded the case for a new trial. Van Buren argued that the CFAA conviction was also improper based on a lack of evidence <clears throat> and that, he that the jury should have been instructed on misdemeanor CFAA violations. Now, to be a misdemeanor instead of a felony, there has to be no private financial gain. And this was all about private financial gain. So the 11th Circuit said that was an improper basis for him to, uh, to get reversal. It, they, they just quickly dealt with it. But they treated the insufficiency of evidence argument as a request to overrule uh, the 11th Circuit's precedent from the United States versus Rodriguez, which was a CFAA case in 2010, um, where a Social Security Administration employee had gone into the database to find information on his ex-wife and his former in-laws and the guy that his ex-wife was dating and, uh, and to harass some of those people. And the 11th Circuit said, yes, the employee had within the scope of his employment the right to access this database. But he had the right to access it for job purposes, 
And what he was doing was not within the scope of his employment, and therefore it exceeded his authorized access. So it wasn't that he, he didn't have a password that could get him into that database, that type of internal hacking. It was access for an improper purpose. So the key question in Van Buren was, uh, is it a violation of the CFAA if a person is authorized to access a protected computer, something on the internet, but does so for an improper purpose? The 11th Circuit said, look, we recognize that there's a split in the circuits, but we're compelled to file, follow our prior panel decision. And it did raise the concerns that, uh, that had been raised in certain of those circuits, uh, the second, fourth, and ninth circuits primarily, and uh, most notably in the ninth circuit in a decision in the United States versus NOSAL, N-O-S-A-L, uh, that appears at 676 F3rd 854. It was an en banc case decided in 2012, um, where uh, then Judge Kaczynski listed a parade of horribles that could come about um, because of accessing something for an improper purpose. What if you're at work and you decide, I want to go on a website and check the sports scores, or uh, take part in an NCAA tournament pool, or go online shopping, or even search for a new job. Most workplaces prohibit personal interactions on the internet uh, within the scope of the use of a work computer. And most people still do it even though it's a violation of the, the workplace rules. But there are a lot of things that happen that are violations of the terms of service uh, uh, of websites. Um, what about a dating site where you change your age or your height or weight or put a picture that's maybe not of you? People have been known to do those things. And they violate the terms of service of the website. Should that be a felony? Should that be a, a crime at all? So the Supreme Court, recognizing the split in the circuits, the second, fourth, and ninth on one side, and the first, fifth, seventh, and 11th on whether an improper purpose could give rise to liability, uh, criminal and civil, under the CFAA. Granted certiorari. And Van Buren raised three basic arguments. First was the text-based argument that exceeds authorized access should be exceeding your authorized access, regardless of purpose. Um, and when someone like him, who clearly was doing something that we think is improper, was doing it using the access he was otherwise authorized to use, it wouldn't be illegal under the CFAA. Number two was the, st the statutory purpose argument. The CFAA was enacted to prohibit hacking, and we shouldn't expand it to cover this sort of thing, even though there's a possible interpretation, as even Van Buren would admit, where accessing information for an improper purpose would be uh, unauthorized. And the third was raising this parade of horribles, the turning of everyday activities into a federal crime. So with regard to the textual uh, argument, Van Buren relied on parallel statutes, other statutes that say that you expressly are not permitted to access information for an improper purpose, um, including the Social Security Administration statute, where it expressly spells out that you're not permitted to do it. The other textual argument that he made was that as originally drafted and enacted before some, uh, some ministerial changes, 
um, there was a portion of the CFAA that prohibited federal employees from using the opportunity such access to federal databases provides for purposes to which such authorization does not extend. So that expressly made um, improper purpose uh, access to information unauthorized or improper. And again, that was taken out of the statute when it was put in final form. Um, in terms of the, the purpose of the statute, the um, accessing of computers without access was viewed as outside hackers, people like the, the ones who got into the Memorial Sloan Kettering uh, database and were nosing around patient records. Um, and inside hackers, uh, you know, the, the person who is entitled to access information relating to the project they're working on, but is not entitled to access other databases with their passwords. And the argument that, that uh, Van Buren raises is, look, there are other laws, other state uh, civil common law uh, causes of action and both statutory and common law misappropriation claims that would cover access for improper purposes. Admittedly, it's not a great fit. You know, breach of contract, misappropriation, those things aren't as good a fit uh, with virtual information or especially with altering information on a website as, as we would like. Um, there's not a perfect statute that covers any of this, and there's not a perfect common law cause of action. Um, the third uh, argument is, again, this, this parade of horribles that were, were listed. Um, and they really come out of the Nossel case, out of Judge Kaczynski's um, opinion in the Nossel case. And, and basically, it says, look, Almost every workplace has a computer use policy, and almost every work website, if not every website, has terms of service. Um, and most people don't read them, and most people don't follow them. And indeed, there are benefits from people not following them. And one of the, the amici, one of the briefs that was filed in the Supreme Court, was by a group of website owners companies that own websites that said, look, we rely on what are called white hat hackers or ethical hackers who try and get in and try and access the data to help us provide security. They, they actually assist us by doing that. But what they're doing would be criminal under the reading of the CFAA that the United States is urging. And we know that there are guidelines that the, uh, the Department of Justice has issued that would uh, limit the prosecutions that will occur under the, uh, the CFAA for now. But we shouldn't have to trust guidelines. If the law says it's illegal, we shouldn't just have to, to rely on prosecutorial grace to avoid liability. Plus, there is this civil cause of action. And there's an incentive for businesses, as we will see, to tamp down whistleblowing with a threat that you're violating the CFAA, to um, prevent employees from claiming damages for uh, conditions of the, the workplace by saying, look, we know you've been exceeding your access and we could fire you and sue you and bankrupt you. So there is the, the threat of, uh, of these lawsuits that actually come to fruition every so often that are, are problematic. Okay, so what does the United States argue in the case? It argues 
the exact opposite on, on the text. It says the CFA, CFAA unambiguously defines exceeds authorized access. Well, it certainly defines it. Um, and it says it's unambiguous in including accessing information for an improper purpose. Um, and and the, the key word there is going to be the word so. Um, the, the second argument uh, that the United States makes is based on uh, the legislative history uh, at the time of enactment of the CFAA. And that says that the CFAA was intended to apply traditional property protection principles in the, in the electronic realm. We didn't have as robust an idea of what hacking could include. Um, we only had a few examples. And we wanted to make sure that the uh, traditional principles applied over uh, the electronic realm, now the internet, as they do in bricks and mortar locations. And finally, the United States said, look, this is very different from, uh, from everyday situations. Um, this is something that we pretty much all can agree likely should be a crime. And it, 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 it's very different from what, uh, what would, would be a terrible situation where everybody would be liable for a crime which they argued, the United States, uh, the, the United States argued, would not constitute use of access, so it wouldn't be a crime. So the first argument um, is based on the text of the exceeds authorized access subsection. And uh, it uses the relation back of the last part of that, that section um, that the accessor is not entitled so to obtain or alter to relate back to um, the access that the accessor is provided. So it says that um, the accessor must use the access so, so to obtain or alter the information. And if it's not entitled to do so in that method, then that is indicating that an improper purpose should make them liable under the CFAA. The other thing is that the legislative, legislative history clearly says that the verbiage change where uh, the CFAA took out this section that expressly uh, um, prohibited access by federal employees for an improper purpose, that was intended not to change the scope of the law. It was not intended to be substantive. So if it was unlawful before, it should be unlawful now. The second argument, also supported by the legislative history, was that the CFAA was intended to apply traditional property protection principles. And it was intended to impose penalties on all criminals who, and this is a quote from the legislative history, use computers to steal, to defraud, and to abuse the property of others. Well, that seems like something that Van Buren did. And that seems like something that then would fall within the, the scope of the CFAA. And then finally, um, the, the last argument on this, this list of possible offenses that we commit all the time um, is that we can easily distinguish between this situation and those everyday acts. Um, and we can do so using the, the term use of access again, from the exceeds authorized access definition. Somebody who's getting on a, a dating site and putting in the wrong information, putting in that they're younger, or taller, or thinner, or have more hair, um, they're not using the access to obtain or alter information. And the other thing that, that um, 
the government pointed out is that the cases that Van Buren cited as being evidence of a concern about uh, this situation, none of them ended with criminal or civil liability. Now we'll talk about some of them and, and talk about how that's a little, little too fine a point to put on it um, because of course there's the threat and there are, there are consequences when a claim is brought against you. So that's what the briefing said. And then the, the argument uh, that occurred um, in November um, uh, occurred in a very different format from pre-pandemic arguments. Uh, if you haven't heard an oral argument or haven't read a transcript in the Supreme Court, um, they proceed very differently these days than they did before when it was a bit of a free for all and the questions were justices kind of often trying to advocate on behalf of one party or the other for other justices. Um, now they proceed by the chief justice calling on first asking a question himself, but then calling on each justice in turn um, in seniority order. Uh, it, it would be too much of a free for all if, if uh, they were all independent and online and trying to talk over one another. Um, but there were quite a few issues that the, the justices raised and it, it seemed like they were, they were a bit split. Um, one thing that came out clearly in the, uh, the argument was there's no good analogy here. Neither side has a really good analogy that explains what we should or and should not uh, prohibit. Um, the the United States, the government argued that authorization uh, was critical, and it did it throughout the questioning. Um, and and said authorization means being granted specific individualized permission. It doesn't mean terms and conditions of a website. It doesn't mean an employment policy. So that was uh, responsive to the parade of horribles, but there was also a contrary parade of horribles that was raised, that there are things like this very situation that may not end up being criminal when everybody knows that they should be, that they, they harm the trust in government that they create incentives that are all wrong. And uh, for example, um, you know, Justice Alito and Justice Barrett suggested they were having trouble trying to find the balance, that they, they didn't come to a clear decision based on the briefing. Um, Justice Sotomayor seemed in Van Buren's camp, as actually did Justice Gorsuch, who was concerned about the trend toward overcriminalization, including uh, the the other count that Van Buren was charged under. Um, and Justice Kagan was concerned about what so meant and and the critical meaning of so in the definition of uh, exceeds authorized access. Um, it, it doesn't break down on, on traditional conservative and liberal grounds. Um, so I think we're going to get a, a split decision most likely because it's been quite a while in, in reaching the decision. And um, I think we're going to get some, some uh, interesting bedfellows in the decision. I'm, I'm hoping to get a decision any day now. Um, but while we're waiting that, we can talk about the, some additional cases. And really, the case that has caused the most consternation um, and, and probably the, the biggest outliers is the United States versus Swartz case. It was a case brought against Aaron Swartz, who um, was a, a young savant who is viewed as one of the founders of Reddit and uh, was a brilliant computer scientist who also believed 
uh, very strongly in sharing information as broadly as possible. And um, he went, uh, he, was, he was a fellow at, uh, at Harvard and um, had access to a database of, of articles called JSTOR um, during that time because of his, his service as a, uh, a fellow at Harvard. And he went on the, the MIT grounds right by Harvard, which is an open campus and allows everybody on it and has open access to JSTOR, went into a closet, plugged in his laptop, and started downloading thousands and thousands and thousands of articles. And eventually, uh, the MIT police knocked on the door and, and stopped him and, and said, you know, you got to come out. And um, the first time he did it, they said, look, just don't do this again. Well, he did it again. And he got arrested for breaking and entering and and then a number of other offenses, um, misdemeanors um, for being in a place he was not supposed to be in. Um, but the state prosecution, the, the state indictment was dismissed when uh, JSTOR prevailed upon the U.S. attorney to bring federal charges for wire fraud and under the CFAA and insisted that Swartz would have to serve jail time. Um, so the U.S. attorney was demanding that he serve at least six months in prison for something that a lot of people didn't think was wrong. Um, and ultimately, it was, it, it, it was such a heavy toll upon Swartz. Um, he, he took his own life. And uh, the, the forefathers of the, the internet um, have, have said, you know, one life is too many to lose. And with something that is so uh, unclear that it should be criminalized, uh, this is a terrible outcome. And the US attorney has actually said that he believes it was wrong. Um, the United States versus Lawson uh, was, uh, a situation where they they uh, uh, the defendant uh, employed hackers to defeat Ticketmaster protections to to get uh, additional tickets. It's it's a exceeds what you're supposed to do on the the website, and maybe it's not fair, but should you really be charged with a criminal offense with that? Now he was acquitted, but even the charge was uh, was questionable. Um, the Drew case, uh, a jury actually convicted on. It was it involved creating a, a fictitious MySpace profile. And the judge, the district court judge, had to acquit post trial and said, this is not what the, the statute should cover. <clears throat> and the final key case that that uh, is, is cited by many people is the Lee versus PS, PMSI case, where uh, after the employee announced that they were leaving, uh, the employer sued based on the employee checking personal email and Facebook at work. The district court judge dismissed the case for failure to state a claim um, because there was not an allegation that this violated the CFAA by exceeding authorized access, but the claim was brought under the CFAA and it can very much have a chilling effect. And it can have a chilling effect on people that we want to encourage in our society, like whistleblowers. And with that, I'll turn it over to Margaret. All right, good morning all. So I have the COVID topical part of this presentation um, concerning Rebecca Jones. So at the start of our story, which has a lot of political and personal intrigue, um, Jones was a data scientist employed by the Florida Department of Health. Um, the story has a lot of interesting personal sidebars, but the fact pattern I'll show you today concerns the topic at hand. Um, she was 
a critic of the COVID-19 data supplied to the public by the state. And she claimed in public that the data scientists were pressured to fix the numbers to make the argument to reopen Florida. You may recall in the news, Florida was one of the states that was sort of at the leading edge of reopening after the initial COVID-19 outbreak. Uh, Jones claimed that the night before the first phase of reopening, she was asked to actually delete and hide data from the public. number of um, claims and counterclaims between Jones and the other FDOH employees about the accuracy of this data. I think some of the most significant concerned testing folks repeatedly. So Jones claimed that any person who tested positive would be counted as a positive only once, even if they were an employee like a uh, health worker who might be tested over and over again as part of their job. Um, she claimed that if they were tested, po if they tested positive, they would only be counted once, or as somebody in a similar position who tested negative would be counted over and over again. So you can imagine how this turns out. Um, it, it provided these, her claims are true. You would end up with a, a numerator denominator problem um, that would affect the accuracy of the data. So as a result of her very public perspective on how this data was being managed, she was terminated from her Department of Health position as the head of their data dashboard. Um, and in June, she established her own dashboard. You can still see both of these dashboards online. And as you might anticipate, uh, Rebecca Jones's dashboard has higher numbers for positive tests than does the, the Florida state run dashboard. But they look awfully similar otherwise. So as Josh mentioned earlier, Jones did file a whistle, whistleblower complaint with the Florida Commission on Human Relations with regard to her having been terminated for speaking out about this data. So on November 10th, a few months later, the Florida Department of Health contacted the police claiming that they had had an incident of unauthorized access to ReadyOp, which is their state emergency messaging system. Um, they also claimed that this same party tried to get to gain access again on November 12th, but was unsuccessful, presumably because they've been blocked by that point. Um, and December 3rd, a search warrant was uh, issued to search Rebecca Jones's home because the IP address associated with this access was traced to her residence. And the search warrant affidavit further cited the Florida statute 81506, section two part A, which I'll show you a little bit later. So a few days later on December 7th, the police entered Jones's home and took computer, phones, other memory devices from her residence. You can actually see a video of this raid on her home online. She was vocal not only about the data, uh, but about how she was treated subsequent to um, having called attention to these issues. Um, so after, after studying the, the information they took from her home, uh, a warrant was issued for her arrest. And once the warrant was issued a day later, she turned herself in to police. And she said she did this not because she was guilty, but because she wanted to protect her family against more exposure to the treatment she felt she'd endured the police showing up at her home. So the next day she was released on a $2,500 bond. Uh, I think it's interesting to note that the prosecutors in the case were seeking a lot of conditions on her release, including no computer access, no internet access, in addition to no contact with the witnesses or people whose personal information she might have acquired through her accessing of the uh, computers. Um, the, they also wanted her to wear an ankle monitor for this. The judge denied the blocking of computer internet access and the issuance of an ankle monitor. Um, Jones's attorney claimed that requesting these factors was a little bit like killing a gnat with an axe. 
he clearly thought it was overkill in this situation. So what statute is that issue in Jones is being charged? So it's Florida Statute 815.06, as I said. Offenses against users of computers, computer systems, computer networks, and electronic devices. A person commits an offense against users of computers, computer systems, computer networks, or electronic devices if he or she willfully, knowingly, and without authorization or exceeding authorization accesses or causes to be accessed any computer, computer system, computer network, or electronic device with knowledge that such access is unauthorized or the manner of use exceeds authorization. So I think what's interesting to point out here is that the crime occurs at the point of access. There is no downstream activity with that access required. The access is the operative verb there. I think it's also interesting to look at the other sections of the same statute, which have arguably much stronger words like disrupts, destroys, injures, contaminant, um, surveillance. Um, but part A is merely the access. So I think it's, uh, Rebecca Jones was charged with a third degree felony, which can carry a penalty of up to five years in prison and a $5,000 fine. I think it's worthwhile to also look at the fact that there are both second degree and first degree options here for this same um, statute. Uh, in Rebecca Jones's case, it's interesting to consider part three within section B in which the person interrupts or impairs a governmental operation or public communication. Um, I haven't seen anything suggesting that Rebecca Jones might have this elevated second degree felony charge brought against her. So apparently they don't believe that her breaking into this ready up government function designed to manage COVID rises to the level of impairing a governmental operation. So you could see how that might be relevant. So what is her alleged offense against computer networks? What is the access that's of interest here? So she accessed the ready op system, as I said, which is the point where, at which the statute would identify the problem. In addition, she is thought to have contacted seven, 1,750 people with a message reading, it's time to speak up before another 17,000 people are dead. That is the number of folks who had passed away from COVID-19 in Florida at the time. You know, this is wrong. You don't have to be part of this. Be a hero, speak out before it's too late. And then um, she allegedly signed the message indicating it's from that state ESF8 planning group, part of the Florida Department of Health. They also suggest that she has downloaded 600 to 700 pages of state records to her personal device, the one they, that they confiscated, including contact information for quite a few individuals. Oops. So this is the part where um, a lot of what Josh was talking about gets really interesting in the Jones case. How was the alleged unauthorized access accomplished? So from the arrest warrant affidavit, which you can find publicly, um, this, the affidavit states, the group state ESF8 planning is utilized by multiple users. Once they are no longer associated with ESF8, they're no longer authorized to access the multi-user group. And all users assigned to state ESF8.planning share the same username and password. So what she accessed was reserved for a group of a group, this group of folks. And once she was terminated, she was not allowed to access it. But she was not, there was no actual um, mechanism that would block her from doing so. So the state did not answer inquiries from a Florida newspaper as to whether Jones was notified actively that she could no longer access the system. However, such a breach by the unauthorized user would still violate the statute, even if there were no proactive notification that she should not be accessing it after her termination. 
I think it's important to note here that the violation required no breaking in um, and there was no disregard for an explicit mandate not to access the data. The only the issue here was that she was using a legitimate login, but she was not she was no longer in the appropriate position to be authorized. I hope everyone will forgive my very um, my overuse of this very tired mechanism, but we'll call on our friends Miriam Webster here to think about the definition of hacker. And I'd like to call the attention to the third and fourth definition that Miriam Webster uses. Number three, being an expert at programming and solving problems with a computer. And number four, being a person who illegally gains access to and sometimes tampers with information in a computer system. I know personally I'm guilty of conflating those two definitions in my head. Apparently, I think a lot of people are, including Rebecca Jones. She claims hacking is not something I ever thought they would accuse me of because I have never displayed any capability of doing that. I've never taken any computer courses or anything like that. So keep in mind, she did not break into the system. She just used the state issued login after the point that she was supposed to have stopped doing so. So as Josh was discussing, there, the law does not make a distinction between the, the process of hacking in the way that most people think of it, which involves a breaking in, and merely gaining access to the to the information when one is not supposed to, or as he was also discussing, when one should not be using it for those purposes. Um, Josh also mentioned that many experts are very opposed to some of these laws. The Florida law is no exception. Stuart Baker, the former general counsel for the National Security Agent Agency, said the statutes tend to be ambiguous and tend to allow for abuse. Some folks think it's problematic that there's no distinction between merely logging in when you shouldn't and breaking in. So the story, as you all probably know, got a lot of attention and was widely discussed in various corners of the internet. And unsurprisingly, I'm going to mention Reddit for the second time during this presentation. Um, some Redditors apparently found that not only were the username and password for the Florida Department of Health site used by the entire group, um, but they were also publicly available if you knew what to look for on the Florida Department of Health website. Apparently, uh, you could download a PDF that had this information, not redacted, and you didn't need to enter any credentials to access this PDF if you knew what you were looking for. So Ars Technica reported on this situation under a tag, which I thought was humorous, worst practices. So we will discuss best practices in just a moment, but I want to call your attention to our next poll question. Please enter the term CFAA into the poll and hit submit. I will go silent for a bit to allow you to do that. And Margaret, I'll just break in and tell you the irony that we all know about the Rebecca Jones case is when the arrest warrant was issued, she had to drive back from out of state. She was living in Virginia and report to be arrested where they tested her for COVID and she tested positive. Yep. A lot of interesting <laughs> twists and turns to this story for sure. Okay, I'll give just a few more seconds. Please don't forget to hit submit on your poll. Okay. So a few examples of best practices that companies and other uh, organizations can utilize to protect their data and networks from um, unauthorized access. Uh, I'm dividing them sort of into the machine elements and the hum ele human elements. I find that to be an easier way to think about it than some of them. So for the machine element, there are a lot of basics that most folks probably know about. Using a firewall and a virtual private network. Don't use old unsupported versions of software that might not have security patches available anymore. Um, you keep up with the security patches for your up-to-date software, that's important. 
ensure anti-malware -mal protection, like virus scans. There are also some sort of next level efforts that folks can make, including encrypting network traffic inside the system, as well as the data at rest inside the system, using multi-factor authentication for users. Um, and then maybe the highest level of going to trouble might be whitelisting, uh, which is exactly what it sounds like if folks haven't heard of it. It's the opposite of blacklisting in which the only things that are allowed are IP addresses and applications that you've explicitly approved. So it's not about leaving out the bad guys, but rather letting in a discrete number of good guys. So that's that's another thing you can do if you're incredibly concerned about the data. As you can imagine, it, it's a little bit hard to manage in case you need a new application, for instance, but it is one of the safest ways to protect the system. Uh, and then as, as relates to the CFAA and the other laws we've been discussing, there's a human element to all of this, obviously. Um, another practice that, that you can use is to implement principle of least privilege for access. That means not giving any users access to more than they need to perform their job function. Um, it requires employees to use individual passwords. A lot of people use the mantra longer and stronger and change them frequently. I, I know we all struggle with those constant needs to update passwords. It's modern life and I'm still struggling with finding a way to manage it, but it does seem to help uh, keep folks out of data they're not supposed to access. And another one that I know a lot of folks see at work are suspicious emails and training employees to delete suspicious emails without opening them. Uh, a recommendation here is to designate a quick, quick responding contact point who can help identify phishing scams as well as spread the word and provide cover for employees. And the reason I say that is because a lot of these phishing scams pose as a superior asking a more junior employee to give them some information or perform a task for them that will compromise the system. And the reasoning employees usually give for complying with these requests is that they thought their boss told them to. So if you can end up in a situation where you have a IT professional um, or other individual who can identify these things as problematic, if you have them as a contact point and you can get in touch as an employee and say, hey, is this real? Then you have backup when you go to say, you know, I didn't answer that because, and you shouldn't answer it. You should delete it, but it's sometimes hard to identify whether it's legitimate or not. So if you have a person on staff who can help identify those and provide cover for employees in just deleting them, uh, that can be helpful. Um, just a little caveat story about these sort of scam, phishing scam situations. Um, the This is known as business email compromise or BEC. Um, it, re, it often results in a lot of loss. The FBI said it, it resulted in $1.8 billion of losses in 2020. And just a, a warning case, there was a company in Scotland that actually tried to sue its now terminated employee for having essentially fallen for one of these and lost the company money. Uh, short story is they lost. Um, and I think it's important to note that as part of this employee's defense, she pointed to a lack of security awareness training at the company. So she argued that she was not trained to recognize these things. So of course she fell for it and thought it really was her boss asking for this information. So the recommendation here is to develop a culture of verification and a strong expectation of caution. So encourage employees to check with their IT folks about these kind of things that they might receive and understand that if there's a, you know, a strange request that you actually do make, um, it might take a little longer because folks need to verify that it's legitimate and it's better to do that than to compromise the computer system. So, with regard to all these interesting unauthorized cases we've been discussing, it might also be a best practice to make clear who is authorized and who isn't. This may or may not protect from uh, not being able to chase these folks up if they if they access your data, you know, post-employment, but it can't hurt 
Um, considering many of these statutes have provisions about knowledge of access being unauthorized on the part of the, fo the folks who are charged, it can't hurt to put current employees on notice of their level of authorization and their restrictions, and also put departing employees on notice that they're no longer authorized, the, authorized to use the system under any circumstances. Um, and obviously detect and respond to any intrusions quickly. I would be remiss if I didn't mention mobile phones as Josh did earlier. Um, examples of ways to protect mobile phones, particularly your work mobile phone, would be to disable Bluetooth when it's not in use, don't use an unsecured public Wi-Fi network, get a security application, use the strongest possible passcode for unlocking, I know sometimes you have a choice between four digits and six. Experts recommend six. And this is the most annoying of them. Consider turning off autocomplete. Um, you know, things that you type repeatedly often come up automatically on your phone. If those things are things like passwords, maybe you don't want your phone to autocomplete that to enable somebody else to gain access to what you've been accessing. Okay, with fair with that, I will stop. And we want to thank you for your attention. And as Josh said, we'll be happy to answer questions after the fact through email. Um, we've got them here in the in the Q and A. Thanks everybody for your time. And that doesn't conclude today's presentation. Thank you, and have a wonderful day.